Now that, that's mobility. Now middle class, so you know, not content with tackling one difficult subject, we thought, well, let's tackle another one that the, the concept means very different things to different people, and that's middle class. You know, our, our first quotation is from Aristotle, and then there's Max Weber, and, and there's a lot of, a lot has been written on the middle class over a millennia. And, uh, and again, you know, more in sociology than in economics, once again, we are actually going to take mostly an economist's look. Uh, but we, you know, and, and, and the difference is, again, that sociologists tend to define the middle class on the basis of many dimensions. So they'll look at occupation, they'll look at education, they may look at consumption patterns. Uh, you know, Weber has a very uh, rich concept of what middle class is. Economists very often will use, again, our vector, and we'll use, you know, some income band. Often it's a relative definition, uh, which may mean just uh, how many people are there between 0.75 of the median and 1.25 times the median. So take the median income, separates 50-50, right, of the distribution, and look at that interval and say how many people are there. That's, that's one way. Other, way. other way is to look, is, is instead of fixing the income band and look at the mass of population, is to fix the population and look at how much income they have. So some people have measured the middle class or the power of the middle class or the importance of the middle class by saying what's the income share of the middle quintile or the middle three quintiles. All of that is fine, uh, though a bit arbitrary. There's also absolute definitions. So nowadays you find a, a literature, you know, people like Banerjee and Duflo have written a paper on the middle class in developing countries where they propose for developing countries a line between $2 a day and $10 a day. Martin Ravallion, my former colleague and boss at the World Bank, now at Georgetown University, uh, has another paper, which is from $2 a day to $13 a day. Those numbers come out of, you know, what the, what the poverty line is. $2 a day is the poverty line in, in, in poor countries. $13 a day is the poverty line in the U.S. We felt those, were, those definitions were somewhat too arbitrary, and we wanted to try and anchor a definition of the middle class even if it's income-based, on something a little closer to, you know, what Amartya Sen would have called functionings. Um, so something about the attributes and behaviors of the middle class. Now that sounds ambitious, and what we actually did was less ambitious than that, but it was to try and anchor our definition of the middle class on one attribute, which is economic security. And the way we did this was to try and find information about how the probability of falling back into poverty over a certain period of time varies with a person's income. And so we'll think of the middle class as a group that's relatively secure, a group that has a low probability of falling into the middle class. So there were three countries for which we had actual panels in Latin America, Chile, Mexico, and Peru. Okay? And we looked at the probability of falling into poverty over, over a five-year interval conditional on the initial daily income that people had, okay? And these lines actually lie remarkably close to each other, as you can see. And they say, you know, the, the, the line is $4 a day. So above $4 a day, if you're very close, you have a high probability of being found in poverty later. If you're farther away, your probability of being found in poverty in the second period is much smaller, right? Now, then we need a cutoff. And so you're going to, you know, you're going to say, well, this is just going to be equally arbitrary. We're just going to move the arbitrariness from this axis to this axis. And I'm going to try and persuade you that we do a little bit better than that. But we started with a 10% threshold. We said, okay, let's call the middle class those people who have no more than a 10% probability of being in poverty five years later. Okay? So that, that's that. And if, and if you use 10%, it so happens that you're very close to $10 a day okay, uh, as, as, your, as, your, as your lower bound. One motivation for 10% is that these are real panels, so they have a lot of measurement error. Looking for zero is almost impossible. There's, we know that measures of, of mobility on panel data are upwardly biased by the existence, even of just random white noise measurement error, okay. So 10% is already a fairly strict line. But then we said, well, it's still arbitrary, this 10%. So Let's look at a different method and see if it disagrees a lot with this method. And so the other method was a subjective 
approach to definition of the middle class. So we went to the Ecosocial data, which is a data set collected from many countries by uh, CIEPLAN, uh, a Chilean think tank. And amongst various other questions, they ask the question, do you see your household as belonging to the low class, the lower middle class, the middle middle class, the upper middle class, or the upper class, five classes? Uh, they don't ask a question about incomes, but they ask various questions about assets. And from those asset questions, using some uh, econometrics and some assumptions, we were able to sort of predict some per capita income. So there's some error around this. But so then what we looked for was a crossing point between those people who consider themselves middle class and those people who consider themselves below the middle class. So what you've got plotted here are the density function of those people who report being low class or lower middle class and those who report being in some other of the, the five states. So this is the middle, upper middle, and upper class. Okay? And so that particular level of income there happens to be the one below which there's more people who think they're poor, let's say, lower, lower middle class, and above it, you know, more people think they're middle class or rich. Okay? Obviously, they overlap. People's perceptions vary a great deal. In fact, the reason we use lower and lower middle together is if you just use lower, there's no crossing. There's always more people who think they're lower middle than lower. People, don't, people position themselves towards the middle. Very few people say they're rich. More people say they're poor, but still not enough. So we had to do some grouping to, to look where this would happen. Now, I've plotted here Mexico because in Mexico, that crossing happens to happen uh, exactly at $10 a day. Now, we did look at five countries, and it does vary. In uh, Chile and Brazil, the number is higher. Okay? But in the other three countries, the number is very near $10 a day. It's 9.7, whatever it is it's in, in the report. But they're very so we said, well, look, this $10 a day that came from that vulnerability definition, from the economic vulnerability definition, or the reverse of economic security definition, doesn't seem to be too far from the sort of lower envelope of what people themselves perceive in this region as being the threshold above which they're middle class. Okay? Now, it's highly imperfect. You're never going to capture everything you want to know from the middle class with one number. Okay? But on the basis of this exercise, we went with $10 a day as the bottom threshold of our, of our middle class. What about the upper threshold? We spent much less time on the upper threshold, and I'll try to persuade you that this was a sensible thing to do. We started with a paper by Homi Karas, who suggested $100 uh, a day, which happened to be the mean per capita income in the US in 2009. It's actually much higher than the median. It's just the mean per capita income in the US. Now, at $100 a day, that would be less than 1% of Latin Americans left in our household survey sample. So we halved it up to 50. That leaves 2.2% of Latin Americans at the upper tail. But we know that at the upper tail, first of all, these things are terribly badly measured. We know that income at the upper tail is very badly measured. Uh, rich people seldom answer surveys, so there's a lot of survey compliance problems. We think uh, when they do, there's misreporting, typically under-reporting. So we know that at, at that upper tail, we're picking up much less income than there in fact is. Okay? Um, so we're not going to worry about it too much. Plus, you see, this tail here is very, very thin, right? I mean, 97.8%. So if I had chosen 45 or 60, the difference to my middle class would be very small. Whereas over here, if I choose 10 or 11, it does make a big difference. Okay, that's just a feature of the density function. Hence, we spend much more time on the 10 than on the 50. And often, I'll actually present these 2.2% of the population together at the middle class. I'll lump them into a middle class and an elite sometimes in the analysis. Okay. This graph is actually not just <coughs> drawn by hand in the computer. It is the, the density function of a combined uh, Latin America I think it's 17 countries, or if not, 15 countries. So we, do, we did combine the data uh, at purchasing power parities for 15 or 16 countries. And this is the sort of combined density function for Latin America that you're looking at here. And with these thresholds that we created, this $10 and $50 a day, um, you end up not with three classes, but with four. And uh, 
And that's a consequence of not defining the middle class by saying when you end poverty, you're middle class. So if you define the middle class in this way that we did, which is consistent either with this view of economic security, you know, a minimum amount of economic security, like a, only a 10% probability of being in poverty five years from now, or analogously on the basis of people's own perceptions, people's reported perception of what constitutes the middle class, then uh, there's a group here between our moderate poverty line of $4 a day and this line of $10 a day, which are neither poor nor middle class. And we hesitated to choose a name for them. Um, we thought of near poor. We ended up calling them vulnerable. And we called them vulnerable in part because of the definition of the middle class, right? They're the people who are not poor now, but have a higher than 10% probability of being poor in five years, at least according to the patterns we identified for Chile, Peru, and Mexico. So you end up with this four groups of people, the poor, the vulnerable, the middle class, and the elite. Uh, and uh, notice that the vulnerable, so the modal Latin American, and the modal Latin American and the median Latin American are neither poor nor middle class at the end of the 2000s. They are in this funny, uh, or not, not, not funny, but uh, this kind of odd middle group squeezed there between four and ten dollars uh, a day. Okay, this kind of uh, purgatory, if you like. 